Okay, good afternoon. Um, I'm David Madison. I am the Associate Curator of Education here at the Orlando Museum of Art and welcome to Art Sandwiched In. Uh, before we begin today's lecture, I'd like to just go over a few of the features in our Zoom webinar. Uh, the participant chat is the best place to share comments publicly with the group but questions for Jillian should be posted in our Q&A feature. And to access the Q&A, you just need to navigate to the Q&A um, located at the bottom of your toolbar. We'll address those questions at the end of today's lecture. Uh, I have the pleasure of introducing our speaker. Jillian Marie Browning is an interdisciplinary artist pursuing themes of feminism, identity, and contemporary Black experience. Born in Ocala, Florida, they received a Bachelor of Science degree in photography from the University of Central Florida in 2012, and a Master of Fine Arts degree in studio art from Florida State University in 2015. They have exhibited their work nationally, and it is included in the permanent collections of the Center for Photography at Woodstock and the University of Maryland's David C. Driscoll Center for the Study of Visual Arts and Culture of African Americans and the African Diaspora. They currently work for the School of Art and Art History at the University of Florida. Again, thank you for participating today and a big virtual welcome to Jillian Marie Browning. Hello, everyone. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. All right, so um, before I kind of start talking a little bit more about my, my work personally, um, I wanted to give you a little bit of um, a little bit of a history lesson when it comes to uh, Black people in regards to photography. So during my time in school, I had to seek out artists that looked like me to find inspiration in the work of others that would directly relate to me in a way that my peers did not have to. Uh, in much of society and education, the work of Black people is excluded and whiteness is the norm. So when it comes to photography and film photography specifically, so sure, there are something called Shirley cards. Um, so from the mid 1950s to the 1970s, Kodak was the main supplier of commercial film. They had a monopoly on the industry and therefore set all of the standards. As a way to have consistency among photo labs, they started using something that was called a Shirley card. Shirley was what was the desired outcome when an image would look like. So Shirley was also always a white woman. It wasn't until the mid 1970s when companies started complaining about the lack of detail in things like wood grain and chocolate that Kodak developed uh, a film that would represent darker tones accurately. In 1995, um, Kodak came out with its very first set of multiracial Shirley cards. And there was literally like a 40 year time span where the Shirley card was just a white woman, different white women, but still white women, and then in 1995 and 1996, we started getting uh, multiracial Shirley cards. Um, so yeah, 40 years until Kodak started to make an official guide for processing film for non-white skin tones. I bring this up because my background is in commercial photography. I worked commercially for years and I knew early on that really wasn't for me. I had worked in photo labs, I worked in portrait studios, I've worked as a professional retoucher and all of these places had the same sort of form of a Shirley card. Um, that was supposed to be your ideal. Editing presets that were made for only light skin tones, uh, lights and portrait studios that couldn't be adjusted, therefore they always underexposed any skin tone that was not light. And um, this was not in the 70s and 80s, uh, this was in the mid 2000s when I was doing this. It's still a standard and it's still a standard in many places. That is why uh, when I was um, approached by Kenya for doing the Blixel project, I immediately agreed. Uh, yes, there is a need for black representation within stock imagery, but not only that, there is a need for the correct representation and depiction of black people in culture, period. I work with Kenya to provide an education on how to properly photograph skin tones and why things may look a certain way. Um, it is often the case that black people have to create what they wanna see in the world. And that's exactly what Kenya is doing. So I've also made it my mission to use myself as representation and to be vocal in what I'm doing and why I'm doing it in my art. My work is primarily self-portraiture, but I do bring in members of my family occasionally if I need to. Um, so when I first started making art, it was not my intention to only use myself. I'm gonna start a little bit of a, a, little bit of a video. 
Um, so it wasn't my intention to uh, only use myself, but when I, the only goal I had was to be true to myself and make the work that I wanted to make and the work that I wanted to see in museums and galleries and just at all, work I wanted to see literally at all. I wanted to make work about my experiences. And yes, my experiences are often universal to many black people that are living in the South, but I also wanted to speak for anyone uh, who did not want to speak for anyone but myself. After a while, using myself and my body within my work became unquestionable. If I was going to be telling experiences about myself or about the experiences that I had gone through, I was just going to use my body for that. I didn't want to use anybody else to tell my story, but I also didn't want to use my body to tell anybody else's story either. Um, so when I went to graduate school, um, this is kind of one of the first projects that I did. I was getting into the idea of performance art because my background was in commercial photography. I had no other sort of background or even like knowledge on other types of art. I took my very first painting class in graduate school. In my undergrad program, it was only photography. That was it. So when I was kind of branching out into making other kinds of work while I was in graduate school, I was really drawn to doing video, but also performance art. So this is kind of my, my first and only live performance that I've ever done called You're Pretty for a Fat Girl. And this particular one was sort of like a touch of me trying to make work that was specifically about myself. I was using things that were said to me by well-intentioned people or things that people thought that maybe I wanted to hear. So as I'm doing this project, I'm ripping off all these comments that, and then throwing them kind of aggressively on the ground. Um, and I'm visibly uncomfortable in this situation because yes, it's something that's very personal. And at that point I wasn't used to making all this personal work, but also I was in front of people for the first time. And that was also very nerve wracking for me. This is sort of the, uh, the aftermath of this particular um, project. This uh, continuing with uh, performance art type work. Um, so this is a piece that I made in 2016 that was the summer before uh, Trump was elected, but this is sort of a direct response to sort of the uh, indignation of, of this sort of a, this flag meaning something my entire life, which is still a negative thing, but also sort of being uh, the pinnacle for Southern Nazism, in my opinion. Um, and the idea that I was seeing this flag every single day, even more so than normal. And as you grow up as a Black person in the South, you understand what the rebel flag is and what that flag means. And it doesn't necessarily have another connotation. So when um, I was basically with this project, I was creating uh, a black substance physically with like parts of my body, like spit and hair and things like that, but also charcoal and making this black substance where I was physically and also metaphorically covering my blackness on top of this flag. And this is a, a still from uh, this particular this particular piece. Um, so like I said, my background was primarily in photography, but as I started sort of ex going into my art process more and spending time in graduate school and thinking about what I wanted my art practice to be, I was really drawn to interdisciplinary things and sculptural things. So I started to um, really play around with other things like things called alternative process. So there are these sort of non-silver photography processes um, that you can do and ones that kind of create sculptural things and that's what I was drawn to so I took one alternative process class in undergrad and I learned how to do uh, emulsion lifts and these are gel medium emulsion lifts and this is kind of my first foray into that these are relatively small they're roughly like 11 inches tall um, and they're laser prints that you coat in gel medium and then you can rub all the paper off with water and you get like a very skin like elastic thing with your image attached to it so for me this was I'm kind of familiar. It was still pictures. It's what I knew how to do, but then also creating a sculptural thing, but also things with still talking about race, still talking about my body, it's skin, it's physically pictures of me. And so it was a little bit comfortable, but also a little bit uncomfortable. Um, I also take a lot of reference images and because I kind of basically know how to work primarily in photography, I took a lot of pictures that sometimes would never live as an actual image. They would just work as a reference image. This particular image, uh, these particular sets of images were supposedly reference, reference images for this project where I was making large skins that I was doing. Um, but as I started kind of looking through them and seeing what they were, I decided that they also could live as um, an image, as a landscape, as like a top, top, topographic image of like what my body looks like and what I am as a person. 
because like I said, representation is extremely important to me. And when I'm looking, when I was looking for inspiration when I was in school, I was trying to look for people that look like me, not only skin tone, but also body type. I was looking for people with gender queer bodies. I was looking for people with fat bodies. I was looking for people with uh, sort of like non-perfect ideal bodies. And you don't necessarily see that at all, that often. So I was like, all right, cool. I'm going to do that. So I use these images to make these sort of larger skins. Um, these are 36 by 48, so you can do large, you know, prints of these. And I also learned too, kind of as I got into my method, that these can get really tattered. These can get ripped. These can get, you know, kind of violent. And so that's what I was sort of referencing when I was doing this particular piece. Um, so in 2017, I got a residency at the uh, Center of Photography at Woodstock to create more of these skins and do a project with them. This particular residency is made for photography. So there weren't necessarily um, resources there for me to be making sculptural work. So I was there sort of making my own studio and making my own things to then think of something that I could do with these, with these that was maybe a little bit different than what I was normally doing with the skins at the time, which was kind of just like showing them in a gallery. So that led me to this particular uh, piece. So um, this is called Southern Trees, Bear Strange Fruit. All right, so I played a little bit of that of that sound. So some of you may recognize that. So that is Billie Holiday's Strange Fruit. So when I was doing this residency, this is in upstate New York. So I had a lot of people who were coming to me and they were kind of like wanting to talk to me about the work that I was creating. This is a residency for primarily people of color. So there's always going to be people who want to talk to you about, about your work there. It's a, it's a very small town, it's a tourist destination. Um, so. But also when I was there, I did not see like any other black people at all at during this time. I was by myself in this in this place I've never been before. And there was no one there that looked like me. And I started having a conversation with some of the people who worked at the art center. And they were telling me that like, yeah, this is the north, this is upstate New York. But if you go farther up in the mountains and into the pine forest, you'll start seeing rebel flags. You'll start seeing, you know, kind of what looks a little more familiar to you growing up in the south. So um, as I started talking to kind of more people in the town, I kind of asked them about that. Um, I got someone to take me up into the pine forest and I um, hung the skins up in the forest and I started taking video of them as they swung and as they kind of fell and as they sort of got more tattered being in this pine forest. Um, and so I'm talking about the idea that yes, we kind of have this, this thought that the South is this you know, terrible racist place, but it doesn't stop there. There's not a line that you hit like we're taught in school even that we're all of a sudden now everything above that line is gonna be great and wonderful and accepting of everybody. Also during that residency, um, I was, like I said, dealing with a lot of, of, of thoughts of being of alone and like there not being anyone there that I could relate to or talk to. I was also staying in this tiny house by myself uh, with like no car or anything. So I was dealing with a lot of thoughts of isolation and kind of making work within that um, and kind of what, what that meant when I was there and what that meant to my artistic practice. Because even though I do uh, photograph myself primarily, I'm a self-portrait artist, um, I also you know, I don't feel like I isolate myself necessarily. I have a bubble of people that I hang out with, but I also often make my work alone. But when I was kind of forced to make work alone, it, it was interesting to kind of think about to kind of be with your thoughts by yourself for 30 days and you're being told to make art and that's like your only job. So it was something I was dealing with then too. More of this work on isolation. So, um, as I kind of go in from this into now sort of a, a body of work that I've been working on for the last couple of years using a process that's called cyanotype. Um, so this particular piece is called matriarchal line. And like I said, I am primarily a self-portrait artist, but I do bring in my family when I uh, really need them to. So this particular piece um, is a piece of about hair within black culture and particularly my family's culture um, and natural hair specifically. So with this piece, um, I, took hair from my mother, my two sisters, and myself, and um, I made cyanotypes out of them. Cyanotype is a contact printing process where you coat um, a light sensitive material on top of like any sort of porous thing. So paper, on these are on fabric. And then you place an object or a negative on top, you expose that to the sun, and anything that doesn't get any light touching it will stay white. 
So that's kind of what these are. So this is my hair. Like I said, my mother's hair and my two sisters. I grew up in a very women led family. I only have sisters. My dad's like the only man in our family. Um, and so we're, it's been very female driven forever. We're very strong willed and we're just very strong people. And so when I was making this project, I really wanted to kind of, um, uh, get scientific with it as like this is like a chemistry process but also when i started making them i started noticing that they looked a lot like dna strands or like uh like things growing in a petri dish because of their round nature um and also looking at the idea that uh natural hair within black in the black community because um i went, went natural now it's much more common for black women to just have natural hair but when i went natural i was 15 years old that was right before there was so many natural hair products where there was a YouTube tutorial for literally everything about black hair. And so I went natural first. Um, my mother is, you know, as much as I love her, she was very concerned about how people were going to react to me not having straight hair. She was concerned about professionalism. She was concerned about literally looking ugly. That was a thing she was very concerned about. Um, so when I went natural, it took a couple of years and then my older sister, then my little sister, then my mother. And it's really interesting to see that like, there are these four women in this family and we all have a different hair texture. And that was something that was, I was really interested in um, as kind of I've seen all of our process. Also the idea of when I went natural at 15 years old, I didn't even know what my hair looked like. I got my very first chemical relaxer at five years old. And I had literally been getting my hair straightened for, for 10 years during that time. I had no idea what my hair texture was. So. As I started doing this project and kind of like making it, getting hair from my family and getting any sort of a woman in general to cut pieces of their hair off is like asking them to cut an entire limb off. So that was extremely hard, but I basically told them that if they didn't love me unless they gave me a piece of their hair. So I got them to give me hair and I started doing kind of these studies on uh, the hair texture and what that looked like within this idea of womanhood, also female craft by doing uh, like embroidery hoops. I grew up in a very sort of, um, traditional female-led family where like my mother, like she sewed, she did all that stuff. I learned how to cook and clean and sew as a young child. That was something that we just kind of like learned how to do. And I'm sort of addressing that in this particular project. And also it's really fun to see how I know what everybody's uh, hair looks like within this, because I, I mean, I did this project, but also all of our hair looks different. So I could pick out whose hair belongs to whom within the piece. And also there are a couple of them where I kind of mix all the hair together and then would make one print out of it. Also touching on hair, um, I did this particular piece uh, that's called Run Your Fingers Through My Hair. And when I was uh, doing this piece, um, I had straightened my hair for the first time uh, in probably eight years. Um, and so I had my hair straightened and I wanted to kind of just like just talk about the idea of, of basically texture and what that is and kind of like the idea that a long, straight, flowy hair is considered the most beautiful hair. And um, like, what does that mean for the hair that I have? And in, in, when it comes to, to black hair in general too, I would say that a lot of people would consider my hair to be good hair. I have about three C hair. So it's a little bit of a looser curl pattern, uh, not quite as tight or coily. Um, but then as you can see, like I'm running my hands through it. My hands are getting caught. I can't necessarily do a lot with this hair. And then on the other hand, I have this straight hair that I'm running my, my hands through. And a little tip I like to tell when I talk about this work is that when I straightened my hair, I went to go show my mom and she was like touching it and massaging it. And she said the words, I'm so proud of you. As if she was so proud that I grew this hair and it was so straight and it was so pretty to her. Um, and that was something that was very jarring that I think people, a lot of people don't necessarily think about, but within the black community and women in general, hair is death is 100% tied to your worth as a person and how beautiful you are and how people even see you out in, in society. Um, and then again, playing on this idea of hair, but also idea of self-portraiture. Um, I was doing this particular piece called Sweet Gentle Lady based on this Langston Hughes poem. And I'm talking here a lot about um, female fragility, specifically white female fragility, but also the idea that black women are considered to be, are, are considered, but also depicted as being extremely strong and not needing to be protected. And um, the idea that, you know, a lot of black women need protection and we are the least protected class of people. Um, and so when I was doing this, uh, this particular piece of cyanotypes, but I use bed sheets specifically. And when I'm doing a lot of my work, I like to make sure that every single piece of it is um, on purpose. So, you know, instead of using just cotton for these, I specifically got bed sheets because I want to talk about the idea of your bed and your home being a safe place. 
um, but also how a lot of times the violation or the um, sort of where you can feel the most betrayed will be the place that you feel the safest. So I was playing around with, with draping and uh, softness and things when I was talking about this, when I was doing this particular body of work. And I've shown it um, a couple of different ways here with it kind of being hung without the extra drapery. And then also I had an, uh, an opportunity to um, kind of recreate this piece um, where I had some windows that I could use. So I wanted to play around with different kinds of softness. So for this one particularly, instead of kind of, you know, using the fabric to be the softness, I use the transparency to be the softness and the drapery to talk about that softness and that desire for softness. And um, so this boils down into sort of an ongoing longer project that I'm doing with sort of these tapestries of my body. So this particular piece is called Transcendent. And I'm bringing back in the idea of, of talking about my, my family and my, my mother and my grandmother specifically, um, but also the connection that, that you often have with your family members and this one's called descendants or your descendants of people who made you and um, how you came up upon you know, being in the world. Um, when I made this piece, I kind of was still working through the ideas. This actually became, it's a piece in general, but it's kind of a sketch for kind of what I've made this year. Um, and so here is some sort of, uh, sort of in the process shots I like to, I to show about this because um, these are another contact printing process. So these are called solar fast and they're not, they work just like cyanotype, but they're a different process where it's still a contact printing process, but it, it comes in colors. It's a, um, you know, a, a basically a light sensitive pigment that you can coat on something and then you put a negative on top or objects and it will create an image. So you see with these, I kind of get a nice sort of a crisp uh, image these are six foot long negatives that I was using. And because this printing process has to be done wet, I basically get one chance to make an image. And if it didn't work, I would have to make a whole new negative. So this is kind of the, uh, like the, the trash pile I had. I would make one and I would just throw these negatives, but also because I was working by myself and uh, it's something you have to do out in the sunlight, um, I kind of had like a really short amount of time to get them done physically. Like I would have to coat, I would coat the fabric, lay down the negative, drag it into the sun, and then, you know, have like six minutes of processing time Time, rip that negative off and run and wash it so that things wouldn't get overexposed and all of that. So also too, as I was making this, it kind of also became the process of making it as well as the outcome of the project. And so when I made this, these sort of sets of images, um, I, again, I use, I like to reuse imagery within a lot of my work as well. So when I was kind of, I had these images that I took particularly for that project, but then I also was like, well, what other ways can I use these? And I got invited to be a part of an exhibition that was about uh, reproductive justice. And I started doing a lot of research on, on reproduction re and reproduction rights and issues within black women. And also too, as I get, you know, I'm in my early thirties. So I'm at the age where people will always be asking like, when are you having kids? Are you having children? That sort of a deal. And so I started doing more research and like, so what is, what are the pros of having a kid in this society or in this economic standing? And I started like finding articles and things about the uh, maternal mortality rate of black women and how just because of our current uh, like healthcare system and health biases and um, even like the standard in which certain things are done, kind of bringing back to the Shirley card where whiteness is often the standard, um, there are sort of, there are certain diseases that black women are more prone to that aren't tested for because uh, white women are not prone to those diseases. There are certain things that you can get that will change the color of your skin or like kind of a, a, a pattern of rashes and things like that, that maybe you won't see on someone who is not fair skinned. And so you do not know to check for those or that that could be the cause of an issue that was happening during their pregnancy or anything like that. So literally the maternal mortality rate of black women is three times that of white women in, in the United States. And also, I mean, those numbers change for Hispanic women, for native women, all of that, because again, we live in a society where whiteness is often the standard. So when I was doing this project, I was thinking about like, okay, so the fact that I am even alive period is a miracle. And the idea that like my mother is alive is a miracle. My grandmother is alive is a miracle because like we can get, I can get pregnant tomorrow and lose my child quickly just because of the, of, of our healthcare, but also to things that are like, the care in which uh, people will give and also the non-protection of black women in this country. 
So as I was kind of developing this project, then I also started developing uh, this project that I called Relative. So I was playing with these images that I'd gotten that I took for the other project instead of kind of putting them together. These are digital um, and I had, you know, they were negatives and then they were positives and then they became cyanotypes. So when I was playing around with these, um, I was kind of working on this idea of like, how would they look, right? So I was like, okay, will they exist as digital prints? Will they exist as this? And then I started thinking about how they would exist in a process that I am spending more time doing right now, like cyanotypes. And uh, thinking about the idea of relative and what that means. So relative is someone that you're related to, like by blood. Also relative, it can be that someone that you are compared to. So when I started thinking about this project and doing sort of these sort of mixed together imageries, I started thinking about the idea of cell splitting and dividing uh, of you growing inside of your mother and also like doing more research on like reproduction and things like that. I learned that um, a woman is born with the amount of ovum they will have for the rest of their life. So literally when I was being like developed inside of my mother, that's all the ovum I will ever have. When my mother was being developed inside of my grandmother, that's all the ovum she will ever have. So literally I was inside of my grandmother before my conception was ever even thought of. So I was, I was you know, honing into that and, and talking about that when I'm doing this particular project and sort of mixing into the idea of mother nature and all of these plants that I have here, and I'll kind of go to kind of the making of these, um, these are plants that I found uh, on my parents' land. Uh, I was getting them on the side of the road. I was getting them from friends who were uh, you know, ripping things off of trees they found to, to give to me to make this project. Um, and I kind of like was, was you know, playing with that. I think like, like where, where, does, where do these plants come from? What do they mean within relation to what the product that I'm doing? Um, and kind of like what this idea of bringing nature into this process means. And so I have some process shots here so you kind of see these are uh, eight foot panels and they are um, eight foot negatives that I would make actually 10 foot panels, eight foot negatives. And um, I would basically have to, uh, you know, coat these large sheets, uh, large pieces of fabric. And then I would put the negatives down and then I would put the plants down and I had, I had my best friend come and help me. And we would get like this, I had a, a, you know, an eight foot piece of plexiglass that we would hold down and clamp to just kind of like get nice prints. And they were 20 minute exposures that basically by the time I got one set up, I could set up a second one and then also get that printing. Also, this process was pretty laborious because I could only really do about two a day when the sun was in the right spot. And also if it was not raining. So again, it became a lot more of like the process in which I was making these and the idea of like, you know, giving birth and also like how laborious the process was that I was making when I was making these. And this is kind of um, a shot of an insulation, insulation, how kind of how big they are in relation to people. So you can kind of see um, 14 of them exist. So I, I, could, I made about 14 and they are quite large. They're currently on display at the Leesburg Center for the Arts. So this is an install shot from when we were doing that. But I like to add in that install shot and also these process shots. So you can kind of see um, sort of the size of them, but also, you know, kind of like what that's like. You kind of walk into this space and you have all of these and how big they are. I want to make them larger than life. I'm not six feet tall. Um, but so then you get kind of, you can get close and also their fabric. And um, at this particular installation, you can walk in between and around them because I really wanted people to kind of um, get inside of them. I'm not the kind of artist that I'm like, well, I don't want you to touch my work. I want you to touch it. I want you to connect to it. And I want you to kind of see and feel it. And also because they're fabric, they kind of move around in the air conditioning and all of that. So you kind of get um, more, it's more tactile. And that's kind of what I'm, I'm more attracted to. So that's my most recent body of work that I've uh, just been working on um, and probably plan on continuing, but that is my entire talk. <laughs> um, so if anybody has any questions, please feel free to, um, you know, to send them to me, so. That was great, thank you. Uh, it's the worst part of, of doing webinars, you can't clap for you at the end, <laughs> but um, fantastic. And so I, I am interested uh, and a lot of, I have actually a lot of different questions for you, but if people um, who are watching right now want to ask Jillian a question, please go ahead and post that in the q and I'm also monitoring the chat, but um, I, we'll be on the lookout for those. Uh, but Jillian, actually, I wanted to kind of begin with where you ended there. So much of your practice 
in terms of the way you're thinking through photography as a sort of a performative act, mm -hmm. as um, less so as the camera is like a tool or a means to an end, it's very much so um, embodiment and, and performance and utilizing that process uh, to reflect on those concepts. And, and so you, you kind of teased it out there at the very end about the viewer. And so I'm wondering about how you conceptually address the viewer in the way that they um, could perform or interact with your work. And if you could just elaborate a little bit more um, yeah. about that process. Yeah, so um, kind of the big question that a lot of people have when they make art is like, who is your audience, right? And so that was a big thing that I kind of struggled with when I was in school for art was like, well, what's my audience? And you know, do I care who my audience is, right? And so um, for a while I did care a lot. And I wanted, I was like, I, I want people to be able to connect with what I'm doing. But after a while I started thinking, I don't actually care if people connect with it because I, I'm making work specifically to sort of bridge a gap and make a representation that I didn't see. So I make my work for myself. But then I also know that there are a lot of people that do connect with that. And for me, it's more important that the work that I'm making is true to myself. But then also that if someone does, you know, connect with it, I'm not trying to make it like commercially, you know, sure. every, everyone gets it. But if there's like 10 people that get it, that's awesome. That's, that's great. I want to have those conversations with those people. But also I, a big thing though too with my art is I want to make it very accessible. So I don't mm -hmm. want it to seem like, you know, nobody can do what I'm doing or mm -hmm. no one can see where I, where I'm, what I'm doing. Like, I'm not very big on like, don't touch the art, don't interact with the art. I'm very much like, if you want to touch it, you can touch it. Like, I don't make things that are fragile, but even the things that I do make that are fragile, I mean, like those skins that I make, none of those exist anymore because they are not it's archival at all. Yeah. You know? But like, but I mean, I had, I have them, I've shown them plenty of times just hanging in the middle. No, I want you to touch it. It, it looks tactile, but you can touch it. That's fine with me because I think that like having that connection with art and making it accessible and knowing that it's not something that like, has to be sacred and protected, you know, like it's sure, it's, yeah, it's something for everybody. Yeah, debunking that entire yeah. sacred art <laughs> myth. I shouldn't say that I work for a museum. <laughs> <laughs> That's what we do. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I see that. I get that. I um, I am interested in like your community too. And like the, so not just your viewer as like an abstract concept, but the community for which you are making this work and, mm -hmm. and you're participating in, um, I know you alluded to it at the beginning, the, the, the project with Kenya Robin, uh, mm -hmm. Robin um, if you wanna just maybe talk about that a little bit more, that project with Kenya and yeah, so, the community that you are cultivating, I guess. Surrounding. Yeah, so with Blitzel, it's really important, um, like when Kenya was talking to me about that, like it was important for me to um, like really, like education, edu and ed I'm an educator first. Like I'm an educator first, I'm an artist second. And so when Kenya was like, this is what I want to do with Blitzel, I was like, all right, cool. I can give you like a ton of resources on how to properly photograph people. Because like I said, my background is motion photography. So mm -hmm. I spent, you know, like literally years of school, like this is how you photograph a person inside. This is how you photograph a person outside. This is how you photograph a person like this. This is how you photograph a person with one light or two light or three lights. Like it's very specific. So when we were talking about this and going through the project, I was like, okay, this is, you know, this is how you would do that. Or this is the difference between like, you know, your light meter saying that everything you're doing is middle gray, but the person you're photographing skin tone is not middle gray. And how do you fix that? Because I think so much stuff is standardized for like that middle gray, uh, that like neutral. And so many people do not fit within that realm that, you know, there needs to be education on how to then get something that will look great for everybody, like, that will work for everyone. Also how to fix something, uh, you know, so that it look, everyone will look good. But then also sort of, you know, that the means of, wanting that representation wanting to see yourself within things you know like wanting to be able to like open a book and see someone that looks like you or walk into a doctor's office and see someone that looks like you on the wall it's not just the standard set of like white people smiling it's everyone smiles you know everyone has birthday parties everybody has all of that stuff so like that's when kenya was like this is going to be this i was like i am so into that and i want to try to help you as much as i can like make this happen mm -hmm. And there's so much growth that, that could occur with that project. Mm -hmm. It's really exciting as well. Um, I know Kenya is focusing on people of African uh, descent, right? Um, 
for this particular iteration, but it, it would be interesting. And then I think the project overall has highlighted that gap, that um, erasure, the absence, really it's not erasure, it's an absence mm -hmm. um, within photography. So uh, thank you. And it, it does sound like you have the, the technical skill set too, right? That, that really, um, the understanding of that aspect. I do, so we have a question from Anne-Marie Furlong who's, who's watching right now. And she um, is wondering if you could talk about your work with still photography versus video. Okay. And have you considered making a video with those latest uh, fabric cyanotypes? And I think uh, I really reacted to watching the skin video that you created mm -hmm. at Woodstock. As a, I mean, I think it's a form of performance and, um, a way of preserving those objects. Again, they're yes. so fragile. You've said that, uh, but but video, yeah, this 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 tension maybe. Um, yeah. So I mean, like I I since that I, that I literally just I mean I conceptualized that project over like a couple of years, but I just made them with like between January and, and the exhibition that I had to have for the beginning of March. So they're still very like new kind of and how they exist in general. So what I can do with them, I mean, I, I haven't stopped with the idea of what I can do with them. And I do have a lot of, of video that I took um, of them hanging, like of them moving and kind of and like, and people interacting with them. But so far as like, you know, if a piece will come of that, I'm not exactly sure yet. Um, but I am really interested in also to like showing the process of them being made and then being born and like how how that looks and and what that means and i'm sort of like thinking about like you know it's it's still long story short still i'm still conceptualizing a lot of that um but as far as right now they kind of exist uh in the fabric panels but also um you know with the video work like a lot of when i was making video work was because i didn't fully know how to step away from using a camera as like the actual in piece yet you know like I, I think i'm more comfortable kind of doing other things now but when i was making video workers i was like i know that i don't want to take a picture but i also want it to be something else and possibly even like a projection or a video seems more tactile to me than like a picture printed on paper so i kind of think i kind of use video work as a little bit of, of a crutch for a couple of years um and but i think i'm you know there definitely are more things i can do with it yeah. absolutely yeah there's a lot of opportunity like i said i really responded to that hunting video that you yeah. created. Um, and I did want to ask, I asked this question of Lajune McMillian, if anyone else wants to chime in, and Lajune is also participating in the Restock Image project with you in Kenya. Um, and I, I'm interested in mentorship mm -hmm. and how mentorship has affected your practice. And Lajune's work is very collaborative by necessity. Right. Mm -hmm. she, she's dealing with so many different kind of moving parts and technologies. And so she has to have kind of all of these different collaborators. Whereas your work, like you, you even talked about it or hinted at it of, about isolation and solitude. And you've been able to kind of reflect and create these works for yourself. Um, and so uh, coll maybe collaboration, but also this notion of mentorship, right? Mm -hmm. um, and who has, and I know you've, you've said Langston Hughes, you've said Billie Holiday, you've made references there, but maybe has mentorship affected your trajectory as an artist? Yeah, so when I, when I was kind of talking about like not being able to see people that look like me in art and like during my education, um, like just, there just wasn't a, a lot of it like my, that my faculty could even tell me. So I was just finding people on the internet. And that's actually how I found Kenya. Uh, when I was in graduate school, I was literally, I think I Googled the word like black female performance artist. And like, I found some work of, of Kenya and like, you know, later on in the years, like a couple of years ago, we actually got introduced, which is, you know, wild to me because I was like, I wrote about you in my master's thesis. And now you're like in front of me as a real human being. I never thought I actually physically talked to you. Um, but so like, but me and Kenya have like, have, you know, she's stated to me that like, you know, they want to to have that connection and that sense of, of community and all of that and like that's something that I'm very interested in and Kenya has been like even in like the time that we've been collaborating on this project has you know given me so much really good advice for you know like them understanding like where I'm at in my career currently and like you know and and what that could mean for me they've been like very open with all of that which has been so great and so wonderful and I've also met a, a bunch of other women who you know reach out to me i think i have an issue reaching out to people i'm always just like you know i'm by myself but people have reached out to me to help me or want to you know talk to me about it and i think that that's 
that's been really helpful for me a lot. And when it comes to like the work that I produce, I do sort of like to talk to people about it. So a lot of times I'll work through ideas uh, with my best friend and just kind of like spit out stuff, you know, at her to like get ideas flowing and, and stuff like that. So uh, mm-hmm. that is a really helpful because I can get kind of inside of my head a little bit. But also for me, like, I know that I say like, oh, I don't really reach out to people for like my own advice, but I am very much open to talking to other people about their work. Like again, I work in education. So like I'm constantly trying to uh, like make sure that I am there for students or there for people who want someone to talk to because like I said, I know what it's like to feel uh, not supported or not see myself within the work that's being given to me while I'm at an institution. So a lot of times students will come to me because they know the kind of work that I make and maybe they're working on a similar uh, project idea or they have similar themes within their work and they want to come and talk to me about it. And I am more than happy to talk to them about that. And I tell that to any random person that emails me, like, I'm so into talking to you about your work. Please talk, ask me about it, you know? Absolutely. Yeah, I was going to ask because you are within a college uh, system, and so education, of course, has to have been mm-hmm. <laughs> has to be important to you. Yes. But but so in addition to reaching out to other mentors and kind of uh, not being intimidated to do that, mm-hmm. what other advice would you give to a young um, artist of color? I would say, out? Yeah, I would say literally be true to who you are and like. I mean, I, t- I mean, I, I really do tell this to a lot of students that like, I, I definitely got like some pushback when I was trying to make work that was like pretty racial or about my body or things like that, or like things that nobody could relate to. Like I had a ton of critiques that no one said anything about anything that I was making. They had, they had nothing they could add to it because they didn't connect with it. They didn't know, but like continue to do that because I definitely could have changed the trajectory of my art making or my career or anything like that. I could have done that but I stuck to my guns and I refused to do that. And I think that I am a better artist for that, for continuing to make the art that I wanted to make while I was you know, doing that stuff. But also again, like don't be afraid to reach out to people. Like most artists are super nice and they want to talk to you. Like it's not gonna be a, a weird situation. Like I have had a ton of really wonderful studio visits and like Zoom calls with people who I never thought I would like be able to talk to. But I mean like they're, if they're a living artist, you can send them an email and I'm pretty sure they will get back to you and talk to you about that kind of thing. Love that advice. Yeah, Yeah, absolutely. Oh, well, this has been so wonderful. I've just really enjoyed visiting with you and La Junet and I just cannot wait to see what happens with this project, um, the Restock Image Collection. So uh, looking forward to that. And thank you so, so much for sharing your time and and thank you for having me. Our community. Yeah, absolutely. All right, everyone. Well, thank you for watching. Um, I hope you have a great rest of your day. All right. Bye. Bye.